So we're going to start uh, by getting to know these five brilliant artists. Um, I've asked them to talk about their work for about five minutes. Um, and then um, I'm going to invite them all up together and I have a few questions for them. And then I really want to open it up for some questions for you guys. Um, uh, you can use the Q&A function and type in your questions there. And Seth and I will be uh, selecting those questions and the panelists can answer them from there. I also want to say that this is our first online panel with this many people and this many panelists. Um, and that's also going to include some media. So this is a real experiment for all of us. And I just ask that you give us as much grace as possible should technical difficulties arise, which they of course inevitably do. Um, so thank you in advance. And um, let me uh, introduce you now to the panelists. So um, on the panel today is Seth Boakley and Drew Pereisner, my partners in this, um, Michael Tara Garver, Laura Jackman, and Janine Willett, um, and David Reynoso. They're panelists from very different backgrounds and approaching this work in really, really different ways. And that's part of what's making this an exciting conversation. I, I'm not going to recite their bios because they're quite illustrious and that would take uh, probably uh, half an hour. So we're going to forego that. Uh, you should receive their bios in advance. And in the spirit of experimentation, I'm going to try a really untraditional approach here and introduce them one by one with a quote from them about their own work. So we're going to start with Janine Willett. And when she starts a project, these, this is, these are the questions that she asks. So this is a quote from Janine. What can we create that is born out of the space? And how can we use its unique history, purpose, and architecture as the inspiration for our process? So I'm going to turn things over to Janine so she can talk about her work. Welcome, Janine. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, that was fun uh, with that sort of surprise quote. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and thank you so much to Seth and Haley for reaching out to me and for the invitation and to the Playwrights Center. Um, and uh, I'm really honored to be sharing this Zoom space with artists who, um, who I really deeply respect. And I've seen your work. And some of you have a lot of TRP fans that I've heard about your work. Um, so it's a really awesome uh, opportunity to, to be here. And I feel really honored. Um, so uh, I'm one of three co-artistic directors of Third Rail Projects, along with Tom Pearson and Zach Morris. Uh, the company has been around for about 19 years. And um, we are based in Brooklyn in uh, in New York. Uh, we are known for site-specific and immersive work. Um, we often like to blur the lines between the audience and uh, the performers and fold the audience into the story that we're telling. Um, uh, as co-artistic directors, the three of us uh, often collaborate together, but we also work independently and support each other in all different ways. Um, we also each create work in many different mediums, um, though we are rooted in dance and theater, and you'll see that when we show you our trailer, where we are very much movers. Um, we are multidisciplinary, and some of the formats that we also engage in are art installations, um, writing and staging and choreographing for virtual reality. Um, uh, I've worked recently on game story and uh, virtual reality uh, escape room and working with live performers in hosted experiences. That's been kind of a new endeavor this last year. Um, uh, Tom has written a, a beautiful book of poetry and uh, in the past year, Zach directed a Shakespearean banquet uh, play. So we expand in all kinds of, of directions and we're really excited to take on new projects and figure things out along the way. We often uh, approach things with the attitude of, we've never done this before. Great, let's figure out how to do it. Um, so in the last eight years, we've had anywhere from around 45 artists to 75 artists working with us at one time. And sometimes we have various projects happening nationally and internationally. Um, probably our most recognized work is uh, Then She Fell, 
and um, then she fell uh, was running in its eighth year when we closed in March. Uh, we're considering this a temporary closure and we are, are looking forward to a Phoenix-like reopening when, uh, when New York reopens again. Um, but that show is run uh, to, uh, we've had between 12 and 14 sold out shows weekly uh, for a really long time. Um, and apart from, of that, from that work, we've made many other projects. We've done a lot of different works in a lot of different settings, a lot of different places, a lot of different countries. Um, we've worked with different communities. We've partnered with different companies uh, and collaborated in different ways. And we're very interested in how we can collaborate with different communities and different groups of artists. Collaboration is a really big part of Third Rail Projects. That's a big part of the fabric of how we make work and how we engage together. Um, some of the things I've been working on and spearheading, uh, last year I made a piece that bubbled up in a corporate mall in downtown Manhattan. It was a, a part of Arts Brookfield, which is a, an amazing organization that's part of Brookfield Properties. Uh, we created a mirage in the middle of a corporate space. And on this island, every day at lunch hour, uh, a new part of a story occurred. So it was an episodic piece that culminated after two weeks uh, in a, a, an evening leg performance that people were able to come to uh, by invitation. Um, uh, I've also been working with Albany Park Theater Project. Um, Albany Park is a, a critically acclaimed youth ensemble based in Chicago. They are incredible and we started working with them in 2014 and that collaboration, we, we started with a residency. Um, we worked for two years and opened Learning Curve, which was an immersive uh, performance that took the audience on a journey in the shoes of a high school student in a public high school in Chicago. And that was a pretty amazing run. We had six months of performances and 33 youth artists that performed uh, in every show. So we're working on a new project that's gonna open in 2021. We don't know exactly when yet, but it's gonna happen. And, uh, and again, we're collaborating with them. Um, and I've also been recently working with Adventure Lab, which is a new uh, virtual reality company. And I've been working on writing and narrative development for live hosted um, escape room type puzzles, which is a whole new thing and super exciting. Um, so I've actually been spending some time in rehearsal in VR, which is a really unusual uh, space, but but oddly very similar in other ways to, to what I'm used to. So that's kind of the, the skinny. I'd love to just uh, turn it over to let you watch our company trailer, because I think that sometimes the images of our work just give you a really good sense of what our work looks like and the kinds of places that we perform and the way that we reframe performance. Um, so I'm gonna be quiet and let you watch.
turn it back over to Haley. Thank you, Janine. That was beautiful. I just love looking at those images. Really want to see all of your work. Um, and now we're going to go speak with Michael Tara Garver. Um, so I'm going to give you a quote about Michael's work. Uh, this is from Michael herself. My approach is to work with artists, activists, scientists, fan organizers, and technologists to bring all their points of view together to create a shared narrative that can be seen in multiple interconnected stories on television, film, and digital, and then allow audiences to interact with that narrative through in-person community experiences. So, Michael, I'm going to have you take it away. Hi. Um, this is truly uh, one of those moments, I feel like this has been happening more and more, where if you've been in theater long for as long and you get older, right, that all the dots connect. There are so many people on this panel who I've either worked with or I'm such a huge fan of. And one of my first jobs, uh, maybe my second or third job out of uh, Northwestern Theater School was with Jeremy Cohen. So I'm always happy to be at the Playwright Center. Um, and uh, it's a uh, it's really great to be here. Um, and and I I guess I want to uh, I'm going to kind of show and talk a little bit about uh not my work but like my journey because i think the thing that um i feel is i look at narrative and have come to look at narrative and care deeply about narrative and have think have kind of learned over time how to translate the language of what it is i'm making into a lot of the different worlds i've been asked to live in so um although i started as a theater artist making um immersive theater in chicago uh the stages upon which i've been asked to work or been offered to work have been really different and um i think it's exciting to think about experiential that way um so i'm going to play this and hope that you can see it i think uh i'm going to assume that that nope 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 um hold on one second and i will share these images share screen there it goes just didn't want to do it um Sorry guys, again, the patience, even though it says I work with technology sometimes, clearly not. Um, so I'm gonna click this and hopefully now you can see, uh, there you go. Um, I'm gonna assume that this is okay now. Um, so uh, basically I, Right now, and we'll get there, I'm the head of experiential entertainment at a new studio in Los Angeles, Category 41. Um, it is the, uh, the um, uh, it is, thank you, Seth, telling me I, he can see it. Uh, it is a, a brand new studio that was launched and it is kind of the job I dreamed of and didn't realize I was dreaming of as it all came along around basically creating original experiential content um, not as branded content, which is how I made my money for a long time, nor is it at a theater or museum institution focused so that it has to fit within a box. Um, prior to that, I founded 13XP, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, somehow I will turn the page on this. We'll see if that can happen. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Playing again, trying again. Um, so the this is a list of all the things that I was called kind of as I was, and it's going to keep doing things as I was moving through. Um, sorry, guys, usually much better at this. I don't know why it's being lame. We'll just do it this way and then you'll see it. So um, I was called an immersive artist and artivist. So I've done a lot of work in social, uh, social justice, which I'll tell you about theater director. Um, I have my master's in it. So at some point, uh, that that must have been something I did and I started out working for Jeremy that way and mostly working in new work um, I would get hired to be an installation artist an environmental artist an activist a writer a divisor a community facilitator and a director and at some point I was trying to come up with language that worked for what it is I feel like I do and also helped me navigate the world I was in and so I call what I do being an experiential architect um, experiential in my mind is different uh, and it uses tools from all of these things. It uses immersive promenade, installation, interactive, site-specific, simultaneous storytelling, environmental, 
sensory symphonies. It uses design, it uses all that. And experiential, if I, the way I think about it is that um, if theater was reflecting back at us what it was, what it is to be human, experiential is reflecting back at us what it is to be human now and who we are and, and what it is to be human now. We live on a series of platforms. We live live, we live on Zoom right now, we live way too much, we live uh, through texting, through, and all of those things for me felt like they were becoming sideshows of each other. And I wanted to figure out how there was, as we built multiple narratives, how different characters, stories, and worlds could live across those. Um, I started an immersive storefront theater. Uh, so um, I, I knew many, many of the folks on this call, uh, in the Zoom from then. And then what started to happen is I would get hired by brands um, as I moved to New York. So to make full immersive experiences, but with narrative. So I made the Black Label Bacon Strip Show for Hormel or full immersive um, experiences for Smirnoff that told the story of a singer and you would journey through it. So uh, what I did is I think those were moments where you get to experiment with your craft. Um, and then I was also commissioned, and this example was the Museum of International Drug Policy by the UN. And this was much more thinking about how technology and live experiences could integrate together to make also social impact. Um, I'll just flip through these. This came out of the fact that I was working with the leadership of the Women's March at that time. And there's a part of, and I'm jumping a bit, but there's a part of the social justice field that's about narrative change. And so I started to think about how experiential and live things could start to take people, not just tell them narrative change and shifting narrative ideas, but take them on experiences in practicing new ideas. So this project was in New York and in Montreal. Um, it toured there. I designed it, but also part of what I'll talk about is the experience of working with how do you create something that has a narrative that has a multiplicity of writers and voices, in particular, if you're trying to think about narrative change um, and also has space for audiences to interact. Um, for a short period of time, I ran a theater company called Woodshed Collective uh, in New York City uh, for about five years. Um, and we, uh, one of the main projects I created there was called Empire Travel Agency. Um, and again, you can go deeper into these projects on my website. Um, but Empire Travel Agency, I always joke, was kind of us doing all of our special fancy tools and making it happen. You sh started at a payphone installation in the middle of South Street Seaport, and you were whisked away in a car into multiple different adventures. And you were following, we had over 30 performers through South Street Seaport in disused spaces from Sandy, as well as on trains and in cars. Um, and we did it for four people at a time. S differently, completely different model, I was commissioned by American Repertory Theater and made a project called Fornicated. Fornicated uh, started with texts from characters to your phone, and they were meeting you through those texts. And then you got to understand and connect to those characters. And then you went to a live rock concert experience and it was as if the people next to you kind of between the song of between seven song sets popped into life and so people said it was like living inside of a movie so it was scripted it also had a two-month script so that's what was being performed on facebook through texting and live in di the different ways we perform that um and then i went and took that and worked with a band and used that in south by southwest to tell their story they had been working with um created an album with a, in collaboration with some um, incarcerated individuals in a jail in Ohio. And so we wanted to like take the joy of that into South by and share those stories. And we did 18 shows in eight days and utilized the texting narrative to get people there. Um, uh, another project really quickly, I'll say I was commissioned by the Goodman theater. Um, and this is something I can answer questions about, but I was commissioned by a lot of organizations to create large, non-traditional, experiential, immersive work that those organizations, and I really love the Third Rail and Albany Theater Project collaboration, it was so successful because many of the theater organizations in making this work, when you're building, we were building a team of all undocumented writers. Um, it was around using the history of the post office as a way that we would actually put people in trucks and send them to communities around the city. Um, that project, these are maps and schematics or or architectural drawings, as I would call them, um, this and this, when I say experiential architecture. But the Goodman, with all its great intentions, um, we were there developing it for two years and didn't have the infrastructure as an organization 
to really think about how that kind of a collective writing process and collective e experience, even though theatrical and using all those tools could be produced. And I think that's a thing where I've been in the process of figuring out where that happens. Um, last but not least, this is a project I'm working on right now. Um, when I joined Category 41, so I launched a studio called 13 EXP, which was the first experiential studio with social impact in its DNA. Each project, many of the ones I've listed here, had a slate of writers, creators, um, all of which were uh, the, the prim primary were women, uh, people of color, and LBGTQ. Um, and the idea was that the experiential entertainment industry was blowing up, like all this money was coming in. I was getting hired by films and all these people to make crazy experiences and everything was experiential. It was just the buzzword. And I wanted to make sure that as original content started to be developed, artists owned that content. Sometimes they're writers, sometimes they're writers plus activists, sometimes they're writer plus activists, designers, technologists. And so we built 13 EXP for that. And then um, that started to grow. And then I was hired just this January started as the head of experiential entertainment at category 41. And I'm building brand new entertainment, not for brands, not for social justice specifically, but as original content built for multiple platforms. Alexandria uh, in November, we brought together a team, uh, a vast range of artists. Um, this is a project that had originally been commissioned by Playwrights Horizons years ago. And um, we did with the New York Public Library. And then I built it out and we're now in the process of actually doing a release version of it uh, during COVID. Alexandria is based on the myth of Alexandria where um, the Library of Alexandria burned to the ground. Um, uh, in, it was the first library on record. Um, and the reason it was burned to the ground, we only have four records of it burning to the ground. We don't have any record of it existing. The reason it was burned to the ground was because it held all of different languages and stories and um, all, if for the first time in one building, it held differing ideas. And to me, that idea became really huge about what our libraries are and also what would it mean if the library Alexandria had been living underneath in the dust all along. And um, Alexandria as a, a, a huge experience is now all of the lost stories coming to life. Um, we're building it for a large building, but we're also building it now digitally and through driving experiences. Um, so yeah, there's more video and more stuff. I would say the biggest thing for me is I believe so deeply in theater. And I think that we now have an opportunity. I think a lot about how we bring all the amazingness of theatrical theatricality to, to connect us among different platforms, ways we live and narrative change. <laughs> there's a lot. Haley, I Thank hand you it back so much, to you. Michael. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Sorry um, for the was, no, that was fantastic. That was really great. Thank you. Um, great. So let's move on to Laura. Um, let's see. So um, Laura, um, I'm just going to intro you. Laura, this is a quote from you. From and this is, uh, Laura's an amazing playwright. First of all, I just have to say that I've admired her work for a very long time. So I'm really excited that you're here in this virtual room with us. Um, and this is what Laura says. The way that I tend to write plays is that I can know a story for quite a while but until I know the sort of structural package that it lives in. I'm not going to make any progress on it. The structure is equally as important as the story in my mind. Oh wow, that's a I I remember that quote. That's quite an old quote, but it it actually uh, it it fits really well to what we're talking about today. Um, thank you so much, Haley. I'm um, really thrilled to be here. Um, I've known Seth since uh, the decade I spent in Chicago, and have been out in LA for a few years now. And um, it's so nice to re meet old friends and and see some new folks as well, especially on this topic. Um, Julia, if we could, I guess, pull up the, yes, awesome, thank you so much. Um, so I uh, wrote exclusively um, uh, for theater for a number of years, and then as of 2013, I segued into television writing, and then in 2015, um, I started writing for video games as well. So primarily for the first few years, um, I was contracting with a studio called Telltale Games, uh, RIP Telltale Games, now defunct, uh, relaunched 
under the same name, but with different uh, principles. Um, so if you could uh, click to the next slide. I, I piloted Minecraft story mode, which is still available. Um, it was ported to Netflix. So uh, it was shrunk down somewhat, but that first season you can still actually play and experience on Netflix. Um, the next slide, uh, I also spent some time breaking story for the first season of um, Batman, uh, Telltale's Batman series. Uh, and the, the next slide uh, is the last game that I worked on with Telltale, which was uh, the third season of their long running Walking Dead game. The first season of that game um, was sort of the thing that launched this structure, which is episodic narrative choice based gaming. Uh, and then starting in about 2018, uh, this is the next slide, I was working for um, a studio called Fogbank, which was under the umbrella of Fox Next, um, for an app called Storyscape. All these little umbrellas and layers. Um, uh, Aaron Loeb was the principal of that company, who, whose name you also might recognize because he's a playwright as well. He has a stealth career as a studio founder and executive producer in the game world. So this was a mobile uh, AAA uh, choice-based narrative game, and I wrote 20 episodes of a game called Life 2.0. It was basically a highfalutin uh, romance game and also gender politics and tech game. Unfortunately, uh, in the two years since Disney acquired uh, Fox Next and Fogbank, Disney decided they didn't want to be in the video game world, so this only exists as Let's Plays on YouTube. All of Telltale stuff only exists as Let's Plays on YouTube. So even though it's digital, the lifespan is sort of similar to theater. So it wasn't a rough uh, transition. Um, if you could click to the next slide, thank you. So as a video game writer, I think a lot of people who don't play games, they think of those big AAA games. So they think of what are basically blockbuster games. They think of Call of Duty, the main mechanic of which is a first person fighting game. Uh, they might think of story-based games uh, like the Uncharted series, the Tomb Raider reboot, um, Red Dead Redemption, open world games, Breath of the Wild, things like that. So the unique thing about Telltale style, which has since sort of, um, sort of blossomed out to other studios and people have sort of been making it their own, is the idea that the mechanic is choice. The mechanic is player agency. So especially with the Walking Dead series for Telltale, a lot of it was moral choices. Um, uh, and you can see here, I've sort of sketched out um, the nodes of what a typical telltale choice would look like. And then we, we'll talk about it in a second, but I have just a, a, a quick glimpse of if I would uh, be working in a script for a telltale game, I have what the script would look like. But essentially the behind the scenes of this game, even though it's animated in a traditional way is, um, you have this dialogue exchange which sort of ends in a feeder question and those yellow nodes response one, two, three, and then silence, which is always the valid fourth choice. Um, those are responses to that feeder question, but that is a place where a player is having agency. And the idea is that all choices matter and the player's choices are dictating gameplay and dictating content. So you'll see how these four responses, which are just dialogue responses, are then trunking back to a new dialogue exchange, which is dependent on what you just said, and they end up teeing up a binary choice. So a binary choice is basically, it's usually an action choice. It's a major decision point. Um, uh, do you save Doug or save Carly if both are being attacked by zombies? Um, so you'll see there, the stories will continue on a branch. So if you save Doug, binary choice number one, you're going to continue those next three nodes. And that branch can be, you know, as long as you want potentially. And then for binary choice two, that's going to continue in a separate branch. So if you're looking at it in a top down model, this is sort of the place where you're making the binary choice and then it's separating and then you're going down on a branch. Eventually it will sort of trunk back up again. Um, Julia, if you could um, click to the next slide. So if I was writing a scene in a Word doc, just in terms of what the script actually looks like, this is the, I mean, I'm not gonna read the scene to you. It's not a great scene. I wrote it as, a, as an example. Um, but you have the feeder exchange, right? You have, and I'm writing action lines because that's something that the animator would take care of. Um, you have that feeder choice, right? And then you have three possible responses. 
Um, one is a lie, one is trying to placate that person, and one is trying to directly confront that person. All of those choices, right, have to trunk back to Marie's response. So I see somebody saying in the chat, is it hard to read to anyone else? Yes, it is hard to read. It's sort of a process of learning to read it. But if you see that line from Marie, you can keep your finger on the trigger if it makes you more comfortable. So if I chose the display text, if I chose I don't have a gun, right? So I choose that choice, it would continue with that exchange. Javier says, I'm not carrying, all the way down through Javier fixes her with a stare. And then it trunks down to Marie saying, I get it. It's hard to trust people these days. So the tricky thing, even with making these little interactive exchanges, is that they all have to sort of connect to that final exchange, right? Because I'm not branching yet. So you have to create each option, the lie, the attempt to placate, and the confrontation as separate valid choices but they have to make sense with what comes after it, basically. So I, I know it's a little bit complicated and I'm, I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A about it, but this is sort of an example of um, the structure and then how the structure is helping you shape the story. So it is leading to these moments of player agency where I might decide that I wanna be the good guy in the game. I always wanna be the peacemaker. I always wanna be helping people out. Or maybe I'm the type of player where I'm quick to violence. I want to sort of confront people. I want to cut straight through the bullshit. Um, two totally valid player options. Um, the next slide, please, Julia. So this is all towards a goal of creating player agency in gaming. The idea that your choices matter. Your choices affect the story and gameplay both in small ways. So in terms of dialogue choices, you could confront, you could lie, or sometimes you could just crack a joke. Um, your choices are also going to affect the game in large ways. So if I have a choice of saving one of two characters, which person am I gonna, which person am I gonna um, save? Another example is I have a vaccine. Do I give a person a vaccine or I just, do I save it for myself? Um, do I tell someone the truth or do I keep a lie for a friend? Um, I think a, a common sort of misconception in gaming, and then I think also when you're translating it to a live or theatrical setting, is this idea that if you are giving a player agency, if you are giving an audience member agency, you are abandoning strong storytelling. That's not what it means at all. Uh, if we get to the next slide, please. Um, so, so really, and we'll see when I talk about the current theatrical project I'm working on, player agency really can begin from character creation. Not all games let you create a character. This is a screenshot from Minecraft. So, this was sort of a very simple binary option. You could choose a male Jesse or a female Jesse. Um, it was a different voice actor. So Patton Oswalt was voicing um, the male character, but we also wanted to give our players the, the option to have a female protagonist, which is still sort of a rarity in games. Um, next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of the character creation portal from Life 2.0 that I worked on. So often with mobile games, um, it, it allows more player agency in terms of uh, you can have skin shading, you can change hair color, um, sometimes you can change the way a few facial fe features look so to sort of customize your character. What we wanted to do here was we actually wanted to create um, multiple unique ethnicities. And this actually unlocked different content in the game. So for instance, if you were playing as a person of color in the game and you encountered one of the main characters in episode one, um, his name is Jaime, the character's name is Jaime. Um, you're uh, at a paid tech internship for the first time. You all have name tags on your monitors so that you can go to your workstation. And his name is spelled Jamie, right? So it's this little microaggression that affects that character's outlook on this job. If you are playing a character of color, it actually unlocks more content and it gives you the opportunity to sort of talk through this with Jaime in the moment. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of choice, it shapes the relationships as well in whatever interactive story you're, you're telling here. Um, these are sort of um, just different screenshots from Life 2.0. Um, the first screenshot, that's actually something that's going to unlock what we call the premium choice, which was giving you, it, it gated content, and if you sort of played into this, you would actually get a whole separate chapter where you got to go to this, um, uh, you got to go uh, basically see Hami's apartment, you got to have dinner with him, and you got to sort of deepen that friendship or deepen that romantic connection. 
And then that screenshot in the middle, the character Mikey, that's actually giving you the option. Uh, he's basically saying, you, Jaime has come back to your place to get a tour. And Mikey is saying, okay, well, your guest has got to sign in. And if he's staying overnight, he's got to pay the $10 overnight guest fee. And this is giving your player character the option to either say, oh no, he's not staying. Or you can pay the 10 bucks, which you know what that means. Or you can sort of freeze in the moment and then there's a backstop for what Jaime is gonna say. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of what we think about in gaming is how are you going to give the player a, uh, an, an opportunity to weigh in or affect content um, at all sort of interesting points. Um, the other important thing is that they lead to different outcomes, right? So this is a screenshot, I think, from, uh, this is the, the third season of The Walking Dead game. I think this is a screenshot from episode 301. Um, so this is, um, are you going to basically seek revenge in the moment? Or are you going to basically like run across this open field, risk getting shot at, but go help out your family? So right there, it sort of allows the player to say, this is the type of player I'm going to be. This is the way I'm going to play the game. I am the person who, if somebody messes with me, I'm going to do something about it, or I'm going to sort of forget about getting revenge, and I'm just going to see who I can go help. Um, the next slide, please. So I've spent uh, about five years in this world at this point, and I'd been searching for a way to bring this branching narrative structure to a, to a live performance setting. Um, obviously, there's a lot of tricky parts about it, which I can talk more about later. Um, in part, it's a very large cast endeavor, this thing I'm working on, but I wanted to give the audience agency, so same thing as player agency, but in a live context, and I wanted to give them a role to play and a goal to accomplish, while also, like I said before, not completely abdicating my role as storyteller, right? So I still want a firm hand on the tiller. I don't want it to sort of be, um, you know, again, an incredible art directed experience that the audience is sort of finding their way through themselves and choosing their story. I still sort of want to have a great deal of control in that, but give a lot of openings for audience engagement um, and player agency and ways to change the narrative. And so how this started to manifest for me was thinking about it in terms of designing a different experience for different groups of audience members and providing different audience members with conflicting information um, for this larger story thing. I also was interested in continuing the experience after the story was over. And so the piece that's come out of this is something called Impact Review. Um, it's inspired by an event that happened at my high school in Shaker Heights, Ohio which was after the 2016 election, there was a massive uptick in racist incidents at sports games, uh, particularly at football and basketball games. If you have watched or read Little Fires Everywhere, Shaker Heights, Ohio, it's the exact same setting. Um, so you might know a little bit about it. Um, it is a designed diverse community since the 1950s. Um, so unlike a lot of other students that I knew in Ohio, our school historically has been about 60% black. And so it meant that our sports teams were traveling around to different, stu uh, different schools in the county where they were uh, possibly playing against teams where there was one black member of the team. These were schools that were 90% white, if not 100% white. And after the election, things started getting ugly. And so the premise of the play is basically you are coming to a school board meeting trying to decide and you're going to weigh in, gather evidence and weigh in about whether the school should leave their current um, uh, basically like athletic tournament to switch to another one. And so obviously the upside is that these students are not going to be forced to, to undergo this anymore. The downside that I've created is that it would disproportionately affect female athletes that more female athletes would potentially lose their sports if the school changes its athletic league. So um, the next slide, please. So when audience members arrive, they're actually split into three different affinity groups. There's parents, there's student athletes, and then there's coaches, faculty, and admin. And so there's a whole sorting mechanism for this, but um, the idea is that basically the Miss Rafferty welcomes everyone, that is the audience, 
uh, uh, all in the same group, and then they're split off into different tracks. And so the idea is that each audience, each group of audience members is sort of staying with their affinity track for a while, then they're all coming back together, then there's sort of a remix, and then they're all coming back together. And then there's essentially a structured debate, a structured discussion that is the school board meeting. And then there's a vote with three possible options, leave, stay, or a tie. Um, so I know I'm over my time. So that, that's the basic premise of the thing that I'm working on currently. Great, thank you so much, Laura. It's really exciting to see your playwriting work transfer to gaming and then back to um, live performance. Uh, so we're gonna move on to David Israel Reynoso. And this is a quote from David about his work. In our hyper-informed age, we as humans have become reductionistic in our desire to understand all that's launched at us every day. I believe it's left us hungry for the real, the awe-inspiring, and the mysterious. Hmm. Wow. How about that? <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and yeah, I think I, I stand behind that comment. I think it is true for all of us. We're curious individuals, aren't we? And we find ourselves hungry for something that is tangible, feels like it has left an imprint. And so thank you for Haley for that, for that reminder. I uh, yeah, don't remember when I said that, but um, yeah, continue to stand behind it. I'm David, I'm a set uh, costume designer, as well as an experiential immersive designer. And I also work as an exhibit designer. So I tend to wear multiple hats and it seems to be the case for many of us here on this panel, that is uh, the way it goes. We um, tend to be uh, multidisciplinarians. We tend to work in hybrid worlds and that is very true for what the work that I do. I'm also the founder uh, of Optica Moderna, which is an immersive theatrical company here in San Diego. Um, and I've gotten to do two projects uh, through them. Uh, one called Waking La Llorona, which was part of the Without Walls Festival in 2017 uh, at La Jolla Playhouse, and was funded by a grant uh, um, of the Creative Catalyst grant in San Diego. My work in uh, experiential immersive design uh, first began when I got involved as the uh, costume designer for Sleep No More in Boston, then got to go to New York, and then premiere in Shanghai, and had no idea what I was getting myself into when I first got involved with Punch Drunk. Um, but to say that it changed my life and also changed my um, sort of the work that I do is an understatement. I feel that out of that, it uh, allowed me to really consider the, the possibilities of how this type of work can really leave an imprint on a, on a guest. And um, it made me curious to think, um, as a designer, as a, as a visual artist, is there a possibility of really thinking of storytelling mainly coming from a point of view that is strictly visual? Certainly, I, um, I don't have formal training as a playwright. And yet what I do as a designer um, has to always consider the story. And so I thought, well, what would it be like to then create a piece that uh, really used visuals uh, at the forefront in the way that they're designed to really convey a story? And so I was inspired by the story of La Llorona, a story that I grew up hearing uh, in Mexico. I was born and raised in Guadalajara. Uh, and I wanted to celebrate my heritage uh, through an immersive piece. Uh, but then also use that piece, maybe re-examine a story that maybe has been misinterpreted or maybe has only been seen through one viewpoint through many, many years. And uh, the story, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is about um, a woman who commits infanticide um, and in revenge. And when I looked at the story, I got to, you know, really be reminded of the story of Medea, the Greek tragedy Medea. And while the story of Medea tends to be considered you know, a great work that analyzes um, uh, injustice, uh, both sort of, um, of, of uh, racism, of um, sexism. Uh, the story of La Llorona tends to only really focus on the fact that this woman was really considered to be a monster. And so I thought, well, is there a way of maybe considering all the circumstances that surrounded her actions, um, and really maybe think about building some empathy for this person who is largely uh, characterized as a, as a great villain. 
And so the, the piece, Noe Kina Yorona, began um, at a mysterious optician's office. You made an appointment, showed up at a time, one person at a time, and you, your, your, your uh, viewpoint was challenged. You were sort of assessed, and then you were outfitted with this optical gear and uh, some headphones, and then sent into kind of a surreal set of different scenes, one by one. And uh, the idea was to really work on um, heightening uh, the senses, almost sort of flooding uh, as a, the senses, so that in some ways we would uh, really work on creating something that was more visceral, uh, that helped kind of make, make you feel a bit more connected with the story in a way that didn't feel that there was an othering of it, but instead of participation. And um, out of that piece, uh, I then was invited to uh, create a new piece for La Jolla Playhouse in 2019, a commission for a piece called Las Quinceañeras, um, and certainly wanted to maybe look through a new lens but for an event um, that certainly when you hear the word quinceañeras, there may be some images that come to mind, which certainly are all very true, but I thought, well, is there possibly maybe um, uh, exploring that rite of passage in a way that feels um, uh, like an exploration. And certainly as a cis male who um, had never had a quinceañera, I sort of thought, well, what do I have to kind of bring to a story of quinceañeras? But then as I really considered that event and that kind of in-between state of being, of leaving behind a season of life before moving on to another, that felt like a very universal theme. And so I thought, is there a way of using this event of a quinceañera um, to maybe explore that a bit in, in some ways that feels accessible to all of us in a way that we all can feel like we in some ways have been quinceañeras in, our, in one summer or another in our lives. Uh, and whereas Waking La Llorona was a one person at a time event uh, sort of um, experience, this was a two at a time. Two people arrived at a time, were outfitted with their optical gear, and then went on separate parallel tracks, but then intersected at different moments, uh, and then also split back up, and then met back for a culminating scene. And what really struck me about that experience was that it allowed um, uh, and encouraged the possibility of um, Comparing stories. I think it's interesting to create a, an event for a, as a singular experience and still aim for it to build community. And I kind of tend to think of creating work like this as um, it's kind of like when you go on a trip and well, you know, like we used to maybe, but when we go on, on a trip and we go by ourselves and then come back and we want to then tell our loved ones all about it. There's something about that that I think is a communal experience, even though it's been an individual one for you. And I thought maybe in some ways in creating a piece, works that are individual, uh, maybe can build, uh, build community and the fact that you're then encouraged to compare your stories afterward. And I think this piece really depended on that. You know, it would be sometimes complete strangers that went through it together and were sent uh, out on their own after. And you would then hear them, complete strangers, now comparing stories and saying, did you see that? What did you make of that? And then uh, being able to sort of piece together um, the story as a whole um, by having to um, then partner up with, with someone. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm so excited to get to um, share more about my, my involvement, uh, but I'll turn it back to Haley for now. Thank you so much, David. I loved looking at those images. Um, so we're going to move on to both um, Seth Folkley and Drew Pariser. Um, they're working collaboratively, so I'm going to give you a quote from each of them. This is uh, from Seth about his work. I'm in love with language and story, but I also love design and experience. When those two worlds meet, a unique alchemy for audience can happen. That's what I'm always chasing as a theater maker. And from Drew, I aim to make work that moves audiences externally as a prerequisite for moving them internally. So I welcome Seth and Drew. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, it's wonderful to be a part of this group and I, I, I love listening to uh, the previous panelists. Um, and 
already so you know buzzing with connections that I'm, I'm eager to hear um, uh, listeners uh, make as well and, and have a conversation amongst ourselves. So um, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, I want to observe though that I'm just excited by um, how everybody who's spoken so far kind of puts together a picture of theater making where theater really is a crossroads of art forms, uh, really interdisciplinary um, in a way that I think the medium has all always been, but um, it's wonderful to sort of think of theater holistically as a place where design and music and literature and even architecture can meet. And so I love just um, sort of seeing that in all of the work that, um, that we've seen. I'm going to talk personally just for a, a couple minutes about how I came to this um, practice of writing for installation work, writing for immersive and devised work, and how I came to this uh, the approach as a playwright where language, the language that I as a writer uh, contribute to a project is really in service to experience uh, rather than the production of theater being in service to words or to a play. Um, so I'm just gonna share, uh, I'm just gonna share this screen. I uh, think this will work. Yeah, so, so the question uh, I ask myself when working on a new devised work and a kind of design driven work or an immersive work is how do words work in this place? Where do they belong in this piece? Um, here apparently on some lampshades. Th these are images, I'm gonna zoom through just a few, kind of a, a wash of images from a company that I worked with in Chicago called Red Moon. And again, this is a, a personal story of how I came to writing for uh, devised and installation and immersive work. Um, and uh, I came about it um, uh, really initially as a director and as a performer, working with this company, a Red Moon in Chicago, again, that did uh, outdoor spectacle work, ritual work, work that we like to say was at the scale of the city. So highly uh, surreal um, visual installation works where language was in many cases absent entirely. These are images from works in um, uh, Chicago public parks where we were um, creating visual installations in response to the architecture of trees, of landscapes, um, and uh, often in our large scale works, here's a big giant dance party, of course, that culminated one of our big outdoor shows. Um, works where again, um, image was dominant and a kind of surreal uh, visual aesthetic was, was guiding everything that we did. Nevertheless, at times working with Red Moon, um, again, as a performer uh, and as, a, as an apprentice director, um, people started turning to me and saying, oh, we need some words here. And I would, and they would say, Seth, you know, can, can we get some words? And the words were sometimes dialogue, but sometimes they were um, maps that were necessary to help the audience sort of navigate through a public park where they were, um, uh, you know, uh, lyrics to a song for example, that would culminate an event. And so I came to sort of see language, oh, and there's me shouting through a, a bullhorn at one point. Um, I came to see language as supporting the experience and as, as following the lead um, of a kind of director and design driven aesthetic. Um, and this actually guided me towards an, an, an interest then in creating promenade works. So uh, at Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago with Dog and Pony, I created a work called The Twins Would Like to Say, a real choose your own adventure kind of promenade theater piece. Um, also dominated by a kind of uh, um, puppetry and uh, sort of design driven aesthetic, um, but telling a true story from the 1980s from Wales, um, where with branching narratives sort of akin to what, what Laura um, sketched earlier. Um, and I also worked in Ireland, um, and this is a, I kind of wanted to include a community piece um, because so much of the work with Redmond was community driven, where I worked with a, a choir and a group of fifth graders to create um, adaptations of literature uh, and convert them into shadow puppetry pieces that were then projected on the side of a, a municipal building in a small town in Ireland. This was a way of sort of engaging with civic celebration and kind of fusing that literary sensibility that I have with that sense of event and spectacle and, and design driven work. Um, and then finally, there's a, a, an image of a work with um, Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival where I adapted the story Rip Van Winkle a couple of years ago. And I just wanted to use this image to conclude this little, little journey um, uh, for me as a playwright where I'm a literary adapter and a playwright, um, but adapting a story, Rip Van Winkle, that was written about this particular place and then set in this beautiful place where a community, a, 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 community cast actually performed this story, forming a kind of linkage with the past and a sort of foregrounding a sense of place and community alongside literature um, for the audience. So, uh, okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up there and I wanna turn it over to my um, compatriot and collaborator and friend, Drew Pariser. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, Seth. And thank you so much, Haley um, and the Playwright Center uh, for putting this on. I'm really honored to be a part of this. Um, again, my name is Drew Pariser. Uh, I'm a playwright, a proud affiliated writer with the Playwright Center. Um, and um, a lot of my experience here, I'll share my screen, um, has been in, in this realm, has been in the uh, large scale themed entertainment exhibition space, uh, most specifically um, with the immersive experience company Meow Wolf. Um, for which I was a narrative lead for a year and a half. Um, I did a lot of both world building and writing of content for them. Um, in the world building realm, I uh, worked on some projects from kind of conception through developing deep history of story spaces and characters um, to kind of the nitty gritty of integrating um, and kind of holding narrative across various themes of artists and creatives. Um, but I think where I really found my my passion and joy is in um, is in the writing of content, and I wrote uh, very interdisciplinary at Meow Wolf, um, as well as kind of in my other uh, work outside of it. Um, so that included uh, narrative books, print objects, um, creating audio scripts you can experience with branching choices, um, interactive performance scripts. Um, what you see in the top right here is uh, a one-on-one -on -one performance um, from a citizen scientist that you might meet in this exhibit, the main Meow Wolf Santa Fe's exhibit, the house with Colonel Return, who would kind of work you through some of the deeper uh, narrative that uh, is kind of contained within the house story. Um, I also have some experience um, creating augmented reality performance hybrid events. I was, uh, um, I contributed text to an experience called The Garage, which uh, in 2019 was a, a top 10 experience as voted by Forbes. Um, so I also was able to work in that realm, and um, also this idea of signage, both um, both in the literal way and I think in a more symbolic way. I think one of the things I'm intrigued by in writing in these various forms in this space is how uh, all deliverables, all written content, all story content, these to serve simultaneously as um, story content that is deep or provocative or funny or whatever the kind of flash effect you want to have is, but also is signage in some way, that it directs you somewhere else in the space, that it keeps you moving, that it keeps you exploring. Um, so that's just a word about my work uh, in this space. Um, I would love, let's see, I think it's a slide, great. Um, I'd love to talk for a minute about Seth and I's work on this project, Superfluxus, and our collaboration. Um, Seth and I met actually at the Playwright Center last summer. Um, I had a reading of, uh, and development, developmental workshop of my play Loverboy that Seth, I was lucky enough to have Seth as dramaturg on. Um, and as we were dining on Indian food in the basement of the Playwright Center, we started talking about our kind of mutual interest in immersive work. Um, and that led to many months of reading Philip K. Dick, talking about retro sci-fi tropes that both really appealed to us um, and kind of was birthed and birthed this uh, experience called Superfluxus, which we imagine as a hybrid immersive theater escape room event. Um, I'd love to talk more to you, Janine, and hear more from you, Janine, about what your work in escape rooms. I was really intrigued by that. Um, so we had, this was initially going to be presented in Chicago uh, next month as part of the Pivot Arts Festival, but we, uh, due to obvious uh, circumstances, had to literally pivot it into a different form. Um, so we are actually making it uh, currently into an online point and click adventure day. Um, so, and to those ends, uh, I'd love to share a few uh, quick um, outlines and uh, wireframes for how we have kind of developed our experience. Um, so this is kind of the wide frame experience. Um, it's kind of, kind of a lot of information, but um, the black arrows are kind of the linear paths with each of these kind of units um, being, having this structure that, that Laura, I think so eloquently spoke of earlier of kind of having a, a trunk that you return to with their choices being kind of branched from, uh, from there. Um, we had kind of, in, in the spirit of trying to have kind of nodules of exploration within an otherwise linear narrative, in our, um, in our live experience, we were thinking of having there be these green arrows, explorable choices that you could perhaps unlock and solve through puzzles to receive certain items. Um, so this would be scene nine, scene 13 would also have this dynamic as well as scene 15. And then at the end of the experience, you would be able to have either a lose state or a win state based on how much of this uh, precious substance you, you collect. Um, in Seth and I's development of this piece, uh, I, I feel like a big topic of conversation for everyone who works in this realm is the balance between game mechanics and story. And uh, I believe um, 
that the more game mechanics come into play, perhaps the less you can have control over uh, um, a dictated ending. And I think for our purposes in developing this story, uh, for this experience, we decided to uh, shift the outline into a space more like this, um, in which you can see there is a more linear progression with a few kind of branching moments. Um, there are kind of explorable kind of arcade-esque sections that you can see in the green arrows here. Um, that do provide flavor and and an amount of agency, um, but for the most part, we kind of stay on one track. Um, and I'd I'd love to hear more. If I, Laura gave a really incredible kind of explanation, I think said something very provocative about um, that player agency doesn't mean abandoning strong storytelling. And I think that's like a very exciting notion um, that that I'd love to hear from her more about and explore. Um, and as a last slide, um, this is just a little bit of a mock-up of the interface that we are uh, currently in the process of designing for Superflex, this, uh, the online game, in which we will have um, kind of self-recorded actors and the, the tapes that are kind of digitally rendered in various ways. And uh, we are substituting the agency of being uh, live in person with someone with um, kind of these button choices, um, much like Laura described for the Telltale games. Um, and with that, unless you have anything else to add, Seth, I will throw it back to Haley. Great. Thank you all so much for sharing your work. It's just amazing to hear from everyone and to see the connections and see the differences of where you're approaching things. So I really appreciate that. Um, I have some questions, but I actually, because of our time, really just want to dive in and let the audience um, ask questions. So if all the panelists could come back on the screen. Um, and we'll go right into audience questions. And I know we have um, a few that are already coming in. So let me um, start with one, which um, is uh, a desire to hear more about how people are navigating trigger content warnings for audience, um, especially in these more immersive experiences. Um, does anyone want to talk about that? I feel so strongly about this because I think it's, um, there was an immersive design summit three years ago and I, I've, I've and, um, I was on a panel, it was the first one. And for those of you who don't know, you should be following No Proscenium, Noah Nelson um, curates and creates uh, incredible content around this and is a colleague and, um, and I was speaking there and, and it was the first one. So like those of us who've been doing it for a while, we're on like every panel. And I ended up on this panel around safety and there was a person who shall remain nameless who brought up on the panel like, oh, when we first give audience members the tools, there's a safety word, but, but we don't tell them that it doesn't work, that we don't honor it. And I um, lost my mind on a panel. Um, so I won't lose my mind today on this panel, but one of the things that I believe is um, as soon as we ask people, if we're coming at it from a theater a theatrical perspective, as soon as we ask people to step out of their seats, we are offering an invitation for a relationship and consent can be creative, consent can be fun, consent can be joyful. Um, and it, it is actually one of the most beautiful parts of narrative, um, the, the invitation to who you are. And so uh, yes, I think there's a trigger warning need, but I also think there's just as much need on the maker side in us really paying attention to the craft with, with, with which we make things. And I've spent a long time being obsessed with that craft for, it's not just for performers, it's how we transition people, audience from digital to live things, the way they communicate in a digital way, the way we all were, could communicate when there, our faces weren't being shown to the way we might be communicating otherwise, the way someone can ask a question and be anonymous and, and all those things to like suddenly we're together. It's that transitional space and, and we have a, a responsibility to dig into the craft of that. Um, so that's a long answer to say like, yes, I have a lot to say about it. It has to be crafted. And the last thing I would say is like, if you think about how long we work at the development of two characters having a relationship with each other in narrative, like we think about character and relationship development, that is what is happening with every audience member. And so you have to set up the space for them to meet you where they are, not for them to have to be where you are. Um, and that creates what I call directed freedom, which is a lot of what, that's like the term I use all the time. How do we build narrative directed freedom for safety and for fun? Um, I'll stop talking now.
Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's, I, I really consider it akin to tutorializing that with this type of work, you actually have to teach the audience how to watch it. And I think as we sort of saw in, in you know, some of the more like worrisome coverage of Sleep No More is, you know, you can have bad fans of something, you can have bad participants in something who are um, game breakers, basically. It's, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure many people who've played video games where you wield a weapon have tried to say, oh, well, the character that I'm talking to, can I hit the character with the weapon? Can I hit the tree with the weapon? Can I hit the dog with the weapon? And there are a lot of people, I think, who might try to break your game. I do think sometimes you can solve that by, yes, it, it is sort of akin to a trigger warning or a content warning. That's both in terms of the material, but especially it's how am I going to navigate through this space? What is my role and responsibility as an audience member or as a, or as a participant? And I think, you know, especially for impact review, one of the things that we're very aware of is I, I called it a debate. That's really not the right word for it, but it is a school board meeting. It is a discussion and it is essentially, it is about race. It is about, are, are you sort of saying if this is going to impact um, athletes of color more, or if this is going to impact female students more, um, who am I voting for basically? And it, it's akin to a very curated, careful, um, sort of aggressive on the part of the moderator, a moderated talk back, essentially, where you have to be a goalie <laughs> and a coach, and you have to be cutting people off, and you have to be throwing flags on the play, but you also have to make it all feel good for people, and you have to make the experience safe for everyone who's going through it. Great. Thank you both so much. Let's take another question. Um, thank you, Bev, for that question. This is a question from Amy. Um, I'm sure everyone has this on their minds, but they, but she'd love to hear more about um, how you're adapting work on, for an online setting, I mean, now temporarily and potentially moving forward. Um, so maybe, I don't know, I know David, we, were, we talked about this, maybe you could talk a little bit about your, your work. Sure, yeah, I'm in the process of creating a piece uh, that's going to be part of um, Without Walls, it's going to be uh, Without Walls uh, online. Um, Certainly we are within walls. And so trying to then think about uh, what are descriptors that remain true when I go to create something in, in, a, in a physical reality that then can be applied to creating something that um, is you know, digital. The work that I've done in times past has very much depended on activating the senses and there's a sense of it very much being, uh, there's a physical response as you kind of are ushered from space to space. And so I think in the way that I was saying earlier that there's, you know, we are kind of constantly redefining what we do and we find that then it's sort of hard to kind of, as the layers start to pile up and things becoming super hybrid. Um, it, I think trying to find that the spine of it feels true to the, um, to feeling theatrical. I think it, it seems that that's like kind of the base root of where we are all coming from. And there's permission for exploration. Um, I think it's really made me think about what are we hungry for now um, as humans in the midst of all this. There's like I think a responsibility as an artist, both to honor um, and also maybe uh, I don't know challenge. I, I, I think it's a uh, it's it's a tricky thing. Without question, it's impacting the work in a large, large way, and I think it's uncharted territory in many ways. I think. I venture to say that all of us could speak to uh, going into projects in which we just had no idea we, what we were going to get ourselves into, where it was going to take us. And part of that was really exciting. And I think that curiosity can lead to great discovery. And I think that's the place I'm in as an artist right now, in which I think, you know, I've never done this before. But what if? What if? And I think that what if is what really can lead to some really exciting um, discoveries. And I think that's where we're all headed. Yeah, I, I love the metaphor of, of hunger and what we're hungry for. And theater makers, I think we're, I know, we're, we're all hungry for for live theater. You know, we're all hungry for live experience. And um, I, I, Drew already spoke about what we're doing to try to adapt a, an immersive work towards um, a digital form. And there it feels like the content and the form are like playing nice together and we're having fun and we're like 
I'm, I'm learning a lot. I love it. It's actually really fun. But I'm actually curious to um, maybe to provoke others on the panel too to think about like, is there some stuff that we're hungry for that we're just not going to get right now and we're just going to like stay hungry or are we going to like hibernate and like, you know, scheme and like come out of this in a couple of years, you know, uh, you know, like out of a chrysalis and, you know, bursting forth with all these new ideas of things that are that are possible? Are we, are we, are we laying low um, with some of our ideas holding them back or are we just trying to translate everything into that, that digital space? Janine, I'd love to hear about what you're thinking right now. Because your work is so sensual and I'm just curious to, to see what you're thinking. I, I think that, you know, there's a, a certain time that probably we need for processing in terms of how we can connect with audiences and, and what it means. Like for us, you know, I think we're still, at least I personally am still kind of grappling with how, how many questions came about having Then She Fell, which breaks all of the social distancing rules. I'm not very sure how, um, how we would want to maybe approach readapting that to be different. I kind of want to leave that as it is and, and allow the world to shift back uh, however long it takes. But I think that there are ways that we can reimagine the way that we engage and take in performance and just figure out, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm just interested in what does it mean if we're all in a big bubble? <laughs> like what is the show that puts everybody in a plastic bubble? And what is the way that we can still be in a site specific space that allows us to be together while we're apart and not try to pretend we're not apart, but just owns it. So I have a lot of questions about like what, what things may look like and what's possible. Um, I, it was interesting that right when everything kind of started to shut down, I was in the middle of working on this project with Adventure Lab, which was about writing uh, this sort of scripting and treatment for these live hosted adventures where players come into virtual reality into your quest and you go through a game with your friends and you become you have an avatar but you actually go through the whole thing and you're talking to each other and you are in this completely different world and then suddenly i was working on that saying oh my gosh this is kind of the only way i'm going to be in rehearsal for a really long time that i put my headset on and i'm in a rehearsal with someone in another state and we're staging and choreographing our avatars. And what is this, what is this new uh, landscape? And at that moment, I realized how, how like prescient that is of like the moment that we're in and also how much I valued being able to talk to the performer in that space and, and like to have like these conversations. So I think that maybe I'm, I'm interested in like what that means um, and how to really like run with that and develop that new part of my toolbox um, while we wait for the other parts of my toolbox that are really intimate and close together while we have to wait for those things to be available to us um, i hope that makes sense <laughs> it makes a lot of sense yes thank you thank you so much um, i'm interested in i just want to say this the space between right like I, I think that there's going to the big thing right now is there's this moment now and then there's going to be we, we dream of the when we all can be in these big spaces again. I think there's this transitional space between those that requires us also to think about the process of how we move an audience and how we teach an audience how to move in all the things we're talking about that I think is actually where our craft is going to step into play. And that's where I'm super curious right now. Um, just to say like it's not either or but that liminal space that I think is going to be sticky for a long time and 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 important for us to learn you know yeah there's going to be a spectrum of engagement and the ways that we can engage um great thank you um here's another question from Tiffany um she would love to hear some favorite moments where audiences surprised you in their reaction to your work anyone want to take this There's a lot of laughing, it seems like. People have, certainly it's evocative of some moments. <laughs> David and I worked on Sleep No More together. So I could, I have a, in Boston, I have my forever list of the Sleep No More surprises, uh, among many others that we've worked on together, but yeah. Anyone else want to jump in? Or, or, it's, or it's just for the imagination and we all have to just imagine what those <laughs> You know, it's hard because you don't want to part of, you know, you don't want to then, in this sort of relationship building that you're describing, Michael, you sort of want to, I don't want to sort of poke fun of our audience. You know, we, we sure. love our audience and we, we feel the reactions that they have and or the curiosity they have is something we delight in. So 
I think it's a positive question, maybe something great and surprising in a wonderful way. Yeah, I think that that's it. I, that, I think that's important to really celebrate the, um, the reactions people may have that, um, you know, that have the impact that the work may really leave for them. You know, I think I was surprised when in creating Yorona, it was just an experiment. I thought, I don't know if this will work. I don't even know if this will even sort of resonate. And then to then have people, audience members who either knew nothing uh, of La Llorona or um, just sort of had heard, oh, I should go see this thing, come out either completely moved then or completely then uh, curious to learn more about um, Mexican folklore. I think that part felt like I'd such a delight and I, a component in which I didn't really, I hadn't really uh, considered. Mm -hmm. And so I think certainly, yeah, there are the anecdotes that feel like, oh my goodness, that was, I can't believe, like I had someone once, you know, unfortunately get sick in the midst of a show and I thought, oh no, how, we had never considered, what, what do we do if someone gets sick? How, what do we do with that? So that can happen. Uh, but then there's also like the really incredible, wonderful um, uh, reactions that people have that then just make you feel as an artist like, Yes, you, you are, your work is being seen and um, it's such, uh, such a rewarding thing to have happen. Great. I think there can also be unexpected, like just in the game conduct, because Impact Review, we're, we're still very, my director colleague and I, Monty Cole, um, we're still very, very early in the process on that. And I actually think workshopping it online is going to be easier because it's a cast of 16 plus numerous facilitators <laughs> to sort of engage with audience. So we might actually be able to uh, develop it in this new online world in a different way. But when we launched Minecraft, I think, uh, so my co-writer, my main co-writer, Michael Chung, we had been, it was a year of crunch. Um, uh, uh, I feel like we went through a war together. Michael and I are very close. We will always be very close because of what we went through to, to, to help uh, make that game. Um, and when I think you're making any sort of video game, especially one where you're trying to figure out who the audience is as you're developing it, the game ended up being, I don't think we were quite E for everyone, but I think we were like ages 10 plus, even though there were kids younger than 10 playing it. And to launch the game, they actually did a premiere at the Arclight in Hollywood that was a live playthrough and the audience was full of kids who were like in Telltale, you see the dialogue choices up on the screen, like A, B, C. And so it was thousands of kids who were screaming out like, A, 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 no, 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 B, B, um, which was incredible to see. And I'd never seen in a game context before gathering that many people to play a game together. Um, and then I think also we, there's an animal companion in the game for your character and we as adults thought it would be within standard narrative tropes that you lose your animal friend in the course of the game. And who boy did we not account for our audience in that decision. And so I still think you can find like videos online of like kids weeping and being like, why, why did Ruben die? Why did they do that? I still get DMs about it sometimes from eight-year-olds, I'm sure. Um, but it was one of those things of the joy of it and also like the risk of it, that we had designed something that was going to get a live response, that was going to get a response that we needed to talk back to in some way, even though this was a single player experience, basically. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another question here from Gabriel. Um, to talk about augmented reality and how it might impact live performance. Where do you believe that that might intersect? Have any of you been thinking about that? I would say the answer is that all of this is gonna impact live performance. And I'm, I guess I'm conscious of time and also me not talking all the time, but it, all of it, it's like, it's like if you can start to think of it like you would work with a lighting designer and how does light tell story, these are just a continued palette and your stage is growing. And so that, that would be my thing as I spend a lot of time getting inside the technology. I don't think it's like it's going to impact theater. I think it's expanding the container of which we call theater. And you still have to make a container. You have to decide what that container is. But like, that's all it is. That simplifies it, but also like you can get that way you can kind of demystify it. Um, but yes, I think AR will, I think all of it is. It's all part of the same thing. It's just what you decide your container is. 
um, at least in my opinion. Great. And I, said, and I want to keep talking. Thank you. And we have time for one last question. Um, so uh, this question is about maybe graduating seniors and what advice might you give them if they're interested in creating performance, maybe immersive experience, um, how can they connect, especially how can they get involved even at this time? Anyone want to take that? Thursday, I mean, it's tricky, right? Because we don't have people right now. But I, I think one of the biggest blocks, I do a lot of consulting work for artists who are interested in either using game mechanics or referencing gameplay in some way in their live theater work. And I'm always surprised, honestly, by how few of them play video games. Um, and I think even if you don't have a console at this point, there are so many game experiences or smaller games that are so accessible now that I think are so useful in terms of, I always thought of a game as one thing and then I experienced like that dragon cancer or I experienced a journey or I experienced some other game where it, it's opening my mind to sort of storytelling possibilities in terms of branching story and in terms of starting to literally figure out if I'm interested in conditionalizing a story, um, I do recommend downloading Twine. Um, it really does help to have some basic HTML background in terms of you do actually have to type many strings of code in order to say a character has a choice. If this is true, then it goes in this direction. If that condition was false, it goes in this direction. It can be a really useful tool to just start to understand some of those outlines that, that, um, that Seth and Drew were putting up in terms of, well, I want the audience to do the, like see this, and then I want this to be the choice, and then I want this to be the, the, the different potentials for where the story could go. So, so Twine is a free thing that you could download and sort of um, start to mess with and, and just start to think of it in terms of story navigation. Um, I know that was helpful for me in terms of starting to fuse these two things together. Great, thanks, Laura. I, I think it's a great time for, you know, game playing, as Laura said, uh, individual game playing. But I also think it's a wonderful opportunity for innovation and creativity in these spaces. And I think of that both in terms of things that can be done safely with distancing like scavenger hunts and games that can be individual, but out in the world, out in the real physical world. And also even taking really creative approaches um, to public art and public space, you know, drive a disco ball through the streets at night and make it shine on all the houses, project a movie on the side of a wall, you know, make a shadow puppet show that you can do inside of glass for people on a sidewalk that you can perform by yourself, you know, uh, take over spaces um, with visual means in ways that are safe. I think this is that time for um, innovation and exploration and creativity. Great, thank you. That seems like a wonderful way to end our panel. It's very inspiring. Um, thank you all for being part of this panel, for your inspiration, for being leaders in this field. Thank you all for being here and being with us. Um, I know many of you out there are actually creating this work as well. And so I'd like to invite people to put their websites um, in our chat just so we can share and learn about work that's happening across the country. Um, I know there's also a question about resources of books or of things that people would recommend. If anyone wants to put any recommendations in the panelists as well in the chat, that would be great um, just so that we can um, share from and learn from each other. Um, so again, just thank you so much. Um, again, if you're interested in any um, more programming at the Playwright Center, please check out pwcenter.org. And um, I hope to see you again online. And more importantly, I really hope that there's a time soon when we can all gather at the Playwright Center in person. So stay safe and um, thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Haley. Thank you all.